What's happening, Deer Park students? This is Mr. Moore here. Um, just want to do a quick little lesson for you about the types of imperialism, right? Imperialism uh, is like kind of a general term for strong controlling the weak, but Europeans did this in many different ways, right? If you look at England, right, this is supposed to be kind of a symbol for England. It's a big octopus, and some of them are uptight, right? Like Ireland is, uh, if you see it, this is Ireland, right? It's pulled up nice and tight next to England. They have strong control over it. Some of them, they have lesser control, okay? Um, some of them, they're reaching out for control, like in Egypt, right? They have strong control over a place like India. But all of these places in uh, England is trying to grab on and control them. How do they control them? That's what we're going to learn about for types of imperialism. This will help you on your projects, right? You have to do this element of the types of imperialism. Here are the types uh, that we're going to talk about, right? Um, now, if we were in class, we would discuss this, but um, being strictly in control of somebody, like this mom here, right, yelling at her son, again, you're going to have more power. You're going to influence them more. You're going to have more ability to change their ways, like if, you know, me being a football coach and like loving the game of football, if I'm strict and I say, ah, oh, son, you have to play football or else. Well, again, he's probably going to play and uh, I'm going to get to live out my dream of having my son play football for me. But disadvantage, maybe he gets resentful for it. Maybe he doesn't want to do that. Um, so again, the strict control is good because you can kind of force your hand, but it also provides for more resentment. Right. Loose control is, eh, it doesn't cost as much, right? It doesn't take as much effort, kind of like this mom and the kid jumping up and down, right? Um, it's it's not as effort, doesn't take as much time, maybe not as, as money, but, you know, the, the person's not going to do what you want them to do. They might act crazy. They might act out. They might um, question your way of doing things, right? And so uh, for British and French, for Americans, they have to think. If we are going to take over the places, should we be strictly controlling them or should we loosely control them, right? For your projects, your colony, your place is going to be strictly or loosely controlled. So when we talk about strict control, we talk about a direct rule. A colony is a direct rule. That's where a colonial government comes in. The elites are removed and replaced. If it's a king or a prince or a chief or several groups of chiefs or princes or whatever, they are removed and replaced by the mother country. Now, this was used because, you know, it stopped the local resistance. Uh, you guys are going to learn about the Sepoy Rebellion in, France, in Britain, kind of loosely controlled India, but the people rebelled, and they said, you know what, we need to directly rule them. We need to bring in more forces to stop any local resistance. And they're going to have more control, more influence, maybe make more money out of it, have more power and more control. Examples, um, settlement colonies. A place like South Africa becomes a settlement colony for the British. Right? A place like Australia or New Zealand, those are settlement colonies. British people actually live there in large numbers. Right? But there is another thing called a dependent colony, like India. Okay, for the French, the French Indochina becomes a dependent colony, which means very few British or French or other Europeans actually move there, but they controlled it through uh, a control of the government. Right? Um, again, less government control, less money, and less influence, less people actually moving there, but they are um, taking over the government. They're having essentially a, a viceroy or a governor of India or a governor of South um, South Africa, whatever it might be, right? And this allows for a uh, more tightly controlled um, rule over a place, right? Um, here's two examples of this. Uh, in this picture here, you see control, right? These guys in the green shirt, those guys are South Africans. Africans, I thought Africans were, you know, dark-skinned people, Right? Well, these people are of British descent, but they are playing uh, British descent, living in South Africa, playing a British sport, right? So this is the British spreading their culture, assimilating their culture onto the people of South Africa. In fact, South Africa is one of the best rugby countries in the world. This is kind of the legacy of British imperialism. Um, 
Whereas this one down here shows more people who are ethnically Indian. They look Indian, right? Their facial features and ethnic background. But they are, again, playing a British sport. Cricket becomes a very popular sport for the people of India, right? And um, they're learning a British game, even though they are not ethnically British. They're ethnically Indian. So this is a settlement colony. This would be more of a dependent colony. Now, indirect rule. Indirect rule is where the local rulers maintain their position. So they leave the chief, the prince, the king in charge, and they just kind of pull the strings. It's like a, a puppet government. Okay, just like this picture down here. This Iraqi guy is the leader, but who's telling him what to say? The Americans. The British liked this indirect rule thing because they had so many colonies. They couldn't directly rule all of them. It would be too costly, too time-consuming, and so they set up a lot of puppet governments. They got what they wanted, the, I don't know, the diamonds or the rubber or the sugar or the tea or whatever it might have been. They got what they wanted um, with little effort. They said, hey, give us your resources, prince or king or whatever, and we'll keep you in charge. Now, again, I mentioned this being a good idea because it made things cheaper. It made it easier for the British or the French to do it. Now, the British preferred the indirect rule. They used this for most of their colonies because it made it easier. They just wanted the resources. They didn't want to influence the culture all that much. For the most part, they just wanted to get the resources out. So it had less effect on the culture, less um, changing to those people. And a lot of these places, yeah, you might have some people who become Christian, some people who speak English, but for the most part, they maintain their traditional um, native or indigenous culture. Okay. Um, two other examples of indirect rule uh, is a protectorate. A protectorate. This is where a country depends on another country for its protection. The United States uses this in Panama. So if anybody's doing Panama for their project, the United States uses a protectorate over Panama. We say, oh, Panama, you're in control. You have your own king, your own government, but we want this canal. The United States helps build the Panama Canal. We just want control of the canal. We want to make sure we can ship goods in and out of this canal back and forth between the East Coast and the West Coast of the United States. And we protect that canal. If anybody threatens that, we'll bring in our military. We'll bring in our leaders. But hey, the rest of Panama, you stay in Panama. Okay, that's why today, if you go to Panama, they mostly speak Spanish. right? They don't have a lot of American um, change. It's not like they're all playing baseball, right? Or American football, right? Um, we just were concerned with the canal and making money off of that canal that we built, we helped build, right? Last but not least is uh, the thing called a sphere of influence. If you are doing anything related to China, some of you might be doing Hong Kong, Shanghai is another example of it. These are spheres of influence where instead of taking over all of China, that would be very hard. China is a massive place with a huge population. Europeans just wanted a little piece, a little chunk, a little sphere of influence. Now you can see over here in this kind of pinkish color, the British controlled these areas. Okay, The French controlled this area down here. Okay, The Germans had their little piece. Sorry, the Germans, this is the German piece. This is the Japanese had their little piece. And this is that, that, that picture we looked at. All the Europeans carving up their piece of China. Who gets the largest piece? Who gets the smallest piece? It's debatable. Now, the Chinese were still technically in charge. You see this green showing the rest of the Chinese empire. But China was being carved up into little spheres of influence. Right? We don't want to take over all of China, but we know we want to trade our stuff. We want mining rights. We want trading rights uh, to, the, to the Chinese market. All right now, when you're doing your project, okay, uh, your place will be some sort of colony. It might be a protectorate. It might be um, a sphere of influence. Do a little research, look that up, and you will understand your colony's type of uh, type of imperialism. Okay, this would be something to add to your project. You say, "Hey, my colony of South Africa is a settlement colony, and this is what a settlement colony means. My colony is Hong Kong." It is a sphere of influence. Define a sphere of influence. That's what you need to do for your project. All right. Thank you for listening. I'm going to post this.
You guys have a wonderful day. Bye.